Hello everyone and welcome to our webinar tonight, To Prescribe or Not to Prescribe, Community Pharmacists Prescribing Rights in Australia. We have uh, over 100 people joining us tonight. There are about 60 with us currently. We're going to get started because we think there will be a long conversation tonight and we don't want to miss any of your insights. So um, thanks for sharing which country you're on. I'm on Ngunnawal and Nambri country also. Um, there is a Q&A function, which we're encouraging you to put all your questions into during the night. If you have a burning question, you can put it in right now, and our team will be looking at those questions live during the webinar, and we'll use those to guide the Q&A session at the end. So put your questions in early, put as many questions in as you want. Hopefully, we'll be able to cover off on most or all of them but certainly those that uh, come up again and again are the ones that we'll start with today. So we might just start because we're just past uh, six o'clock and uh, I'd like to start by welcoming everyone here and also acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands that I'm on. I'm on Ngunnawal and Nambri country. I like to pay my respects to elders both past and present and acknowledge their continuing relationship to the country here. I'd also like to give a special welcome, a warm welcome to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are with us today on the webinar. So we're, I'm really delighted to be here and I'm delighted to have so many of you with us. So we've got a pretty simple agenda and I'll, I'll just run through it for you. So I'm um, just nearly finished doing our welcome and introductions. Then one of our team members, James Ansell, will run through the key um, outcomes of a survey we recently did with some consumers asking them what their views were about prescribing, um, pharmacists prescribing. And just to be clear, we've taken a consumer's view here on prescribing. That is, consumers are thinking about this topic as something my GP or other medical practitioner might have prescribed for me in the past that now I might be able to have a community pharmacist prescribe for me. So that's the way that consumers are framing this. Are there things that a medical practitioner has prescribed for me in the past that now I could ask a community pharmacist to prescribe for me? So we're using that as our general definition. We'll look through the thoughts consumers have about that very question. And following that, we have three really interesting case study discussions and we'll be asking each of our panellists to give us their views on these case study discussions and the three key topics we've decided to deep dive into tonight. After that, we'll be moving to the Q&A session. And that's where, as I said at the very beginning, we're relying on you to start putting all of your questions into the Q&A area so that we can use those to have a really interesting question and answer session at the end. Um, hopefully that'll take us to around 7.30, at which time everyone will be in need of caffeination, food, or goodness knows what else, and we'll say a fond farewell. Following this webinar, we will send out a link to the recording to everybody who has registered for this session. So if any reason you have to leave during the session, we will send you a recording of the entire session. Okay, and thanks so much for everyone putting their details in the chat and also indicating the country on. I love to see people dialing in from all over Australia. It's fantastic. So we're going to move off now with our, um, our um, survey results and we're going to ask James Ansell to um, um, go through the uh, key uh, findings. Thanks, James. Thanks, Elizabeth. I'm uh, coming in today from uh, another wall in Nambri land as well. I want to pay my respect to uh, Aboriginal people here today and acknowledge uh, sovereignty was never ceded. Uh, so I'm the research and policy advisor here at CHF. And as part of my role here, I manage the Australia's health panel platform, which has a very brief and quick bit of background is a survey management system that CHF uses to take the pulse of consumer user experiences, thoughts around parts of the healthcare system how consumers are interacting with it. So as part of that, in December last year, 2022, feels like a long time ago now, 
131 people participated in this survey where we asked uh, how people viewed the idea of pharmacists having prescribing powers. And broadly speaking, consumers were very interested in this. Uh, we delineated between new prescriptions and repeat prescriptions because we felt that there were different circumstances for those two sort of things. But even within that, most people were not opposed to prescription pharmacy, uh, prescriptions through pharmacies, which is, is a double negative. But to kind of dig into that a little bit, only about one in four people were opposed to pharmacists being able to do new prescriptions as a blanket rule. And then less than one in 10 were opposed to them being able to do it through repeat prescriptions. But a large number of people had conditionals on this sort of pharmacy prescribing where it wouldn't be the same free range as with GPs or nurse practitioners or other sort of primary providers, but there'd be some sort of uh, reduced scope where it was okay or permitted for a pharmacist to do that. I'm also gonna note here that I'm just gonna say GP a lot within this text because that's who we framed the survey around, but the results also apply to nurse practitioners or other sort of uh, providing or prescribing providers. So when we asked about new prescriptions, the reasons that people were in supportive of this were generally speaking, because they thought the pharmacists were medication experts. They know a lot about medications and medicines, how they work with each other, how they work with the human body. So people thought they were well positioned to give prescriptions and give, give advice around what should happen around those medications. People also reported that pharmacists were often the first point of call where when they were along well, they'd go to their local pharmacist, try and get something over the counter. And if they couldn't get it over the counter, they'd then have to go to the GP or hospital. And if they could get some, some prescriptions done at the pharmacy, that'd kind of save them some time and some resources. GPs in particular are noted as having extended wait times, particularly in rural areas. And so pharmacies were seen as a, a way to reduce the demand on, on GPs to free up appointment slots so that other people can see them for other needs and let people access the medications or medicines they need without having to wait days or weeks to be able to see a GP or a similar sort of provider. And additionally, the same way that people have, have their GP, they have their optometrist, they have their dentist, a lot of consumers reported that they had their pharmacist and that pharmacist had been their pharmacist for, for much, much time, many time, much time. And because of that, they thought that the pharmacists had a good idea of their overall health and they were happy to have that pharmacist give them advice and prescriptions because the pharmacist understood their, their health status and their overall conditions. In terms of why people were opposed or concerned about pharmacists having prescribing abilities, the, the big one was that they weren't sure or they didn't think pharmacists had the, the skills and the tools and the diagnosis and resources to do diagnosis of conditions both in terms of like their training and medical background, but also in terms of facilities like consultation rooms and the ability to draw on pathology or other diagnostic tools in order to figure out what the actual problem was to identify what the, the best medication was to treat the problem. Similarly, people were concerned that pharmacists often or generally didn't have access to our consumer's health history and their other health conditions. And so the pharmacist might misdiagnose something or prescribe something that will cause issues through interrelations with how the other with the consumer's broader health status or other, other treatments or health things that were going on. A few people also noted there was potentially some financial conflicts by combining the dispensing of medication with the prescribing, where concerns or, or factors that weren't about safe use of medicine or quality health care may affect what is or isn't prescribed. And additionally, consumers saw a lot of value in pharmacists providing a, a quality assurance checking of what the GP or other provider had prescribed them as like a second set of expert eyes to look at what had been given in the prescription and see if there was, if it was good or if there were maybe some issues well, so they could go back and get it looked at. In terms of the circumstances around the conditional approval, there was a lot in here around people having very varied and diverse views around what would and wouldn't be okay for, for pharmacists to do. But in a broad sense, consumers were pretty happy with pharmacists doing new prescriptions for a narrow preset list of preset list of approved purposes, particularly for things that were minor, were seasonal, were long-term or recurring, thinking things like seasonal asthma, migraines, contraception, chronic illnesses, and related complications from those. 
where the things could be diagnosed on site easily enough, and whatever was being prescribed was a low risk medication. This is particularly true when the pharmacist could fill a gap within the healthcare system. So there was what GPs or other providers provided at one end, and then there was the hospital or emergency department at the other end. And people didn't want to wait just, you know, four or five weeks to see their GP, but they also didn't want to go to the emergency department because it wasn't that bad. So there was this middle ground where pharmacists could be uh, fulfilling as giving access to medications, uh, particularly when they're in a rural location or it's an after hour situation and other pathways are no longer available. But consumers also wanted this to be accompanied with a broader set of reforms or changes to the way the health healthcare system worked, particularly around making sure the pharmacists did get specific training and accreditation as part of their, their scope of practice to make sure that when they're doing diagnosis and prescribing, they're doing it in a, in a safe and effective manner. And that there's improvements in infrastructure and interoperable, my favorite word, are records, so that a pharmacist has a consultation room so people can have a, a private conversation in, in a safe space. And that if a pharmacist does do a prescription, that isn't a siloed record, but it interacts with my health record or the GP's records or ideally both, so that the GP and the consumer can keep an eye on what's going on as part of the holistic healthcare. And on the reverse side, consumers are pretty happy to carve out some things that pharmacists should not have as part of the prescribing ability. Things that were completely new and out of nowhere that there was no patient history of, so it was a, a, new, a new condition that needed to have a full diagnostic check done on. Anything that was complicated, so needed pathology tests to, to make sure the diagnosis was accurate. Any sort of treatment that was required, like a pain medication or something that was addictive or required close dosage management, because that sort of finesse was thought that need that, that higher level of care. And also antibiotics were a thing where there was a lot of mixed views where on one hand, antibiotics as a concept, consumers didn't want to have be, be available because concerns about superbugs, but specific things such as UTIs, consumers didn't want to have access to. So a bit of, a bit of to and from about where the line of antibiotics should, should sit about pharmacists prescribing. For repeat prescriptions, this was very similar in terms of the reasons why. The only new one is the first dot point here, which was that the diagnosis has already been done. And this kind of swept away a lot of the, the primary concerns around it being a new prescription, where because the diagnosis had been done by another provider, the pharmacist was just continuing that care. And so people were really happy for them to be able to do that. And they felt that repeat prescription appointments were often kind of a waste of everyone's time as they're often done, where it's a bit of a tick and flick exercise, so a tick and flick. And that's a time that the GP could be spending with another person with a much more serious concern that needs more urgent care. So people felt almost guilty taking up time for something that was done within 30 seconds and then they were out. In terms of opposition to, to repeat prescriptions from by pharmacists, again, a lot of similar reasons for new prescriptions, but the new one in terms was this first dot point where the GP or a similar provider were thought to be best positioned to identify quickly if changes could be made to the, what the prescription was, particularly if some the medication they were on had some sort of changes to it, or if a new alternative had been made available, and that that could get the consumer onto a new, better treatment faster if the repeats had to go through the pharmacy, sorry, had to go through the GP still. And then in terms of the, situ the circumstantial conditional, yes, but a uh, pharmacy prescribing, similar reasons as before for the new ones. If it was something that was already known, it was a long-term thing, if it was able to be interoperable digital records so that the GP could see that repeats were being done and be kept in the loop, people were happy with it. The only new thing here was again, this top dot point where the Consumers thought there would be or should be a limit to how many repeats you could do. So you couldn't get a prescription now and just get repeats ad nauseum until I'd say 2012 for the end of the world, but that was actually a decade ago, apparently. So I don't want to talk about that. Uh, but you know, ad infinitum until the end of time. You had to go back to your GP and get an overall health health checkup. And digging into those limits again, conceptually, consumers thought about the limits in two ways as, as we framed it to them, where it could be. A limit as the number of prescriptions given, 
or a limit as in the number amount of time since you saw your GP or equivalent provider where you could be getting medications prescribed or repeated. And on this side, there was quite a divergence between new or repeat prescriptions, where for new prescriptions, most consumers, about three out of four consumers, thought that it should be a limit around the number of prescriptions you had, and it should be a low number, like one to three, after which you needed to go see another primary provider or a, an overall health, health checkup. And consumers weren't really interested within, or well, literally half thought it would be okay for there to be a time limit of about six to 12 months where after that time, no more new prescriptions, you need to go to the GP. Whereas for repeat prescriptions, consumers, about two thirds of consumers thought both or either a number of prescriptions or a time limit was appropriate, which kind of shows that people feel that for repeats, it's more about how long it's been since you saw your, saw your GP and got that overall checkup, after which it, you needed to, to go back and get things looked at. But within that time period, again, about six to 12 months, uh, you should be okay to be getting repeat prescriptions for something that's part of your, your ongoing health, health condition. And then a few broader things, uh, consumers overwhelmingly were like, yeah, I'd do it. I'm fine with getting it myself. About 85% of people saying they would get a prescription from a pharmacist in some way or another, particularly repeats again, noting that the benefits for increased accessibility while you're traveling or if your GP is away, where you go to the pharmacy. A few people noted that another potential benefit is if you register with a provider or a, a provider group, they could integrate your care with your GP, with your specialist, with your other providers as part of the holistic data set of health and well-being to make sure you get good care at all levels. And also having a sort of greater linkage within the data sets that way could provide like a tangential benefit of, of it being easier for people to manage their medications and scripts, particularly when they've got lots of them. But the big, the, the big concern about the sort of approach of pharmacists prescribing was a worry that this was a bit of a band-aid solution to the larger issue of GP accessibility and affordability, where that's becoming an increasing problem for people that can't access GPs, can't afford to see a GP. And there was a concern that this was kind of trying to solve that problem without actually solving that problem. People were worried about that. They also noted that there were concerns about uh, data linkage, well, con not a concern, but an acknowledgement that linking data increasingly does raise potential risks of data breaches and data misuse, which needed just to be managed appropriately. And that there was a concern that if pharmacists were able to do prescribing, that could cause delays on other services. So rather than, you know, you wait four weeks for a GP and then you see a pharmacist, you're out in 20 minutes, Suddenly you're waiting three weeks to see a GP and waiting three weeks for the pharmacist to dispatch your medications. So overall worsening of the timeliness and accessibility of, of medications. And then as a very broad brushstroke thing, people noted that it needed to be Medicare bulk billable so that it was affordable and wasn't relying on private health insurance or out-of-pocket costs. And that if it did happen and there were differences between what a pharmacist could prescribe and couldn't prescribe and what a GP or an health practitioner could do, it would need to be a, a health literacy sort of campaign explaining to people those differences so they knew where to go under what circumstances. But yeah, those are the, the broad headline results. The report will be published soon uh, and you can all look at it and dig into the numbers. Uh, but if people have any questions, happy to answer them or we'll move on to the discussions. Thanks very much, James. There's a lot in that. Um, I, I think we might have a couple of questions in the Q&A, Joe. Um, yeah, thanks, Elizabeth. Um, thanks, James. Um, one question was about, did the survey ask whether consumers' opinions differed if the prescribing pharmacist was in a community pharmacy and so therefore dispensing or alongside GPs in a medical clinic? Um, it didn't differentiate between the two of them. It didn't differentiate between the two of them, but the survey was specifically asking about community pharmacists. So it was talking about pharmacists who are both dispensing and potentially prescribing. Okay. And the other question was about the representation of various states in, I guess, in Australia's health panel 
Um, Pip Brennan asked, did we get responses from WA, South Australia and the Northern Territory? Do you, can you remember whether we did or whether we've got data on that? I believe, I'd have to look at, oh, where's my sheet on? Um, I think the only one we didn't have responses from was the Northern Territory. Also, I guess, other Australian territories such as North Oak Island and Antarctica. But uh, all the mainland states plus Tasmania and Canberra had, had people participating. Did we also ask whether people were prepared to pay a, a pharmacist for a consultation for a prescription or did we not touch on that? We didn't ask specifically what they'd be prepared to pay, but it emerged a lot. So not a, a lot of this analysis came from open text results where and the idea of it being a uh, bulk build emerged from from that so it was a thing that unprompted people were had were concerned that the amount that have to pay would be unaffordable if it wasn't bulk build which is probably echoing concerns about non bulk build services more broadly within the health system at the moment particularly post covid or post covid that's all the questions on the actual survey i think elizabeth I think there's one Paresh just asked that's just popped up. I saw Joe. Hi, Paresh, which was whether people identified their health status as part of their survey response. So did we know who they were? Were these a whole lot of young, healthy people answering? Um, I'm suspecting that the text responses gave us a window into that. But James, I'm sure you can provide more information. Uh, yeah, so as part of our standard demographics, we asked them to self-identify their health status. Uh, I can't find the specific page where that was, but it's something on the borderline of 80% of people identified as being in excellent or good health, 10%, 10 to 15% were fair health, and 5% were, were poor health. Uh, I, I believe it also skewed a bit older than the general population in terms of uh, not, a, not many young people, lots of middle aged and uh, wise members of society participating. Great. Thanks very much, James. Um, no problem. We're going to move on now to the panel conversation. Remember, the Q&A is still open and James will be here for the whole session. So if you've got a question about the survey results, then feel free to pop it in the Q&A. And if we have time at the end of the session, we'll come back to that. One of the things that came out for us in looking at all this data was that there's a lot of complexity in people's views, lots of ifs and buts and whens. It also seemed that there was a little bit of a difference between how people thought they would be able to use this potential service. So if I need the service, I trust that I will use it responsibly and I trust that my GP and or my pharmacist will be able to support me to do this safely versus the views that people sometimes expressed about everybody else in the nation. And at times, people seem to suggest that I could do this okay, but for everyone else, you might need a number of caveats. And as you saw, they were very broad and differed across a range of different factors. So we're going to try and ask our three um, panel members to have a little bit of a think about some potential case studies and share with us their thoughts about in this situation, what should be considered and how comfortable they might be with this from a clinical and consumer perspective. So we'll, I'd like to introduce our panelists now. Um, I don't know if you can see them on the screen yet. There they are, look at the smiling faces. So I'm just doing them from um, right to left. We have Aish Nadu, who is a consumer representative. Um, she undertakes a range of different um, um, opportunities that CHS offers for consumers and um, really delighted to have her here today. Thanks, Aish. We've also got Dr. Faye Sim, who is here representing Community Pharmacy. Um, Dr. Sim is the current president of the Pharmaceutical Society of Australia and works in community pharmacy. And um, finally, we have Dr. Michael Nolan, who has been a GP for longer than anyone would care to remember and works in a very busy practice in inner Melbourne with a high load of older people who have significant chronic disease. 
So we'd like to thank all of our panellists for being here tonight. And we note that we're not funding them to be here. Um, then they're, um, they're not, as I'm aware, sponsored by anybody. They're here as independents and they're providing us with their own views about these three different scenarios. So let's um, look at the first one. I think it's going to come up on the screen in one second. Thanks, James. So the first is a scenario around non-dispensing pharmacists. So these are pharmacists who are working not in a community pharmacy setting, but in a setting such as residential aged care or general practice. And the question we're asking is, should they be able to prescribe medicines? Again, remember, we're using that definition, the consumer definition of things that normally my doctor did for me. Now the pharmacist might be able to do this for me. We know that um, there are a number of places around Australia where within a general practice setting, there are non-dispensing pharmacists also working in a multidisciplinary team. And we also note that government has funded um, a trial of um, pharmacists working in residential aged care facilities. So in this case, these on-site pharmacists will review medicines and work with the resident's local GP um, to help manage their medicines. So I'm going to start with you, Michael, and then I'll go across to Faye and Aish. And my question is, do you think that non-dispensing pharmacists should be okay to work in these environments and also um, undertake not only medicines review and uh, medicine literacy and medicine safety work with consumers, but actually um, undertake the prescribing work that might have been usually undertaken by a GP? Michael. So... It's no surprise to suggest that I don't think this is the greatest idea. Um, I think one of the things is that we're seeing here is we're asking pharmacists to step outside their great skills in, in medicines and understanding medicines and interactions, et cetera, to move into a whole new area of, uh, of what must end up being diagnosing, which would include examining uh, a skill that I don't think pharmacists really have the training for. Just to remind you, to be a general practitioner in Australia, which is a specialist role now, it's five years undergraduate training, a year of, of internship, and then another five years of general practice training. So that's, uh, if I add it all up correctly, 11 years of training to become a GP. And even then, you're only just starting to, to understand the whole area of managing patient care. Um, I think that, that uh, if you were going to go down a pathway uh, around this, I assume the pharmacist would have to see the patient. Um, do they do they examine them? Um, what would be the scope of the range of medications that you would be looking to do? And I'm trying to think of things in aged care, for instance, that would allow. And I, and I, and I because I, can't, I haven't got that experience of pharmacists working in a general practice. But having said that, I have very good relationships with my local pharmacies, uh, and will often talk to them about things and, and stuff going on. So it, it would have to, you'd have to be very specific about what you thought they were going to do. Um, pick, pick an example, someone's got a respiratory tract infection. Well, that's again going to be way beyond the scope of anything that I think a pharmacist could understand how to assess and decide whether someone gets a treatment or not. Um, I can think of one where there might be a situation where a pharmacist has availability in an age, particularly aged care with uh, COVID antiviral medication, um, particularly for patient test positive on a weekend that the GPs are not available. Um, most of the facilities have a pre-arranged agreement with their patients or residents that uh, if they test positive, they will or won't have antivirals. So there's an example of something they could be useful for. Um, I understand they they have the they understand the risk with a lot of medications. I just can't see how you take that step from diagnosing and treating. Great, thanks very much, Michael. Now I'm going to throw it to you, Faye. What are your thoughts? Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, could I please um, start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that we're all dulling in from today? And for me, I'm currently in Western Australia, and this is the land of the Wajak people, and I pay my respects to the elders past, present, and emerging. I would also like to extend my acknowledgement and appreciation to um, those who may be on the call today who identify as from the First Nations peoples. 
Um, and thank you to CHF for this opportunity to present a view of the pharmacist and Dr. Michael Nolan and also Ash, I'd just like to acknowledge the panelists uh, as well tonight. Um, Dr. Nolan, you know, I, I really have to say I, I, I agree 50% with what you were saying, but there is a 50% um, there that I would um, respectfully disagree. And the reason is because I think um, it's safe to say that if you ask the majority of pharmacists will tell you that pharmacists have very good working relationship with their GPs. Um, I have very certainly very good working relationships with the GPs next door uh, to my pharmacy. And as you've rightly pointed out, you've got very good relationships, working relationships with the pharmacists next to you as well. So no pharmacist will actually ever say that, um, you know, they would ever have the same extent or same scope of practice as um, GPs. GPs undergo long extended um, trainings, as you've rightly pointed out and the scope of practice of a GP is, is way more than the scope of practice of a pharmacist when it comes to diagnosing a condition. Um, but the conversation here is around well then if we if we accept that we do have a health system issue at the moment with people having access problems getting into into their regular GPs, let's look at how we can enable all health professionals to practice to their top of scope so we can actually together enable that sustainability in the health system. So is there any, for example, acute conditions that require very acute care, um, say within the first 48 hours that uh, a pharmacist will be able to provide care to fill in the gaps while someone can't get into the GP and then facilitate referrals to a GP when the GP becomes available? Or alternatively, you know, is there a chronic health condition that is stabilized diagnosed by a GP already, um, and the patient is stabilized on a medication prescribed by their regular GP, but the condition is stabilized, can a pharmacist do more there to extend the prescription length, if you like, so that it frees up the GP time and GPs can actually see more urgent, complex care. So it's about all where all health professionals can actually work together collaboratively and practice to their top of scope. So going back to the case scenario there, Elizabeth, around, um, you know, should a pharmacist in a GP clinic prescribe or not prescribe? I mean, in any setting, in my view, it goes back to three key principles. Should a pharmacist prescribe or not prescribe? The first thing I would ask myself is, is there a consumer need? Is there a consumer need? Is there an issue around timeliness access to care? If there is a need for consumer to access timeliness of care and that need is not met at the moment, then we ought to look outside and see what we can do to actually enable patient access to care. And that could mean a non-dispensing pharmacist prescribing um, collaboratively with the GP in that particular GP setting. And it could also include community pharmacist um, on some other range of conditions outside. And the second principle there is around multidisciplinary collaboration. In any setting, whether it's in community pharmacy or GP uh, clinics or in aged care facility, uh, we are of the views that pharmacists must work um, very collaboratively with the GP. And that interprofessional collaboration must be seamless and there must be monitoring in place and referrals um, to ensure that. And the third thing is that none of this accessibility should be should take over the importance of medicine safety and safety of consumers. So any such pharmacy services, whether it's in a community pharmacy or in aged care or in GP clinics, there must be appropriate governance and there must be a safe and appropriate parameters in place for this sort of pharmacist services. So that is why you would see all of the trials in relation to prescribing, there is a specific modules on training the pharmacist to undertake a very limited scope, and there must be very clear parameters um, at which time a pharmacist must facilitate referral to a GP. Great, thanks very much, Faye. Um, and now I'm going to pass across to Asia and ask her, are there any, if you've any thoughts about the idea of a pharmacist working within aged care? Thank you. I'm thanks, Faye, and thanks, Michael. I'm just joining in from Darug Country. Um, I'm not so equipped with knowledge surrounding aged care in this sense. However, I do want to say, and I do appreciate what Faye just mentioned. However, my family and I have a very negative experience accessing healthcare um, in Australia, and um, simply because of the patient journeys of and, and of my late grandfather and. Um, I would love to see a day where there is collaborative care. And I know there are multidisciplinary teams out there in hospitals and in GP practices working together to assist in a um, patient journey or consumer journey. However, I personally and my family, we did not have that. And 
if it is able to be seamless, um, I think prescribing would be okay with repeated scripts. Um, I know that for myself, I've got a basic level of health literacy. However, for our vulnerable or disadvantaged populations where you've got your minority um, community people who may not know what um, how their specific health condition may contradict with a medication that's prescribed or how a pharmacist may um, diagnose or, you know, get that medicine across. So I feel like that might be a risky practice uh, just from what I'm looking at and my outlook on this. Um, and I also wanted to just say, I wouldn't personally know what I can or can't take um, if, if it's something out of the ordinary, if it's some condition that I've never experienced before and I have no idea how to go across in uh, recover, recovering from that. Um, however, I do appreciate that it would be great if um, there is this there is a certain strategy in place that would, um, I guess, decrease the pressure that GPs do currently have or struggle with. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Aish. So we've got three different views and um, uh, about the role of a non-dispensing pharmacist in aged care. And we're really interested in your views too. So we've got some Zoom live polls lined up. If you haven't used these before, we we'll, should see shortly a um, poll on your screen and you just click the button. Can we make one choice? Are you a yes or a no or I still don't know? Um, we'll share this um, information with you um, at a later stage, but right now we just ask you all to vote and whether or not a, um, a non-dispensing pharmacist should be able to undertake the role that would normally be undertaken by someone with a medical qualification um, in relation to prescribing medicines in um, uh, outside of a community pharmacy setting, so in residential aged care or in general practice. So I'll just give you a minute or so to have a think about that. Put your um, answer into the poll. Um, panelists can't vote. So for those of you that are on the panel there, you've had your say. Um, this is for the 100 or so people that are online and um, we'll um, share that with you in a little while. Um, so we're going to move on now to our next case study. And again, I encourage you, if you've got questions about anything, to pop them into the um, Q&A because we're getting closer to the time where we'll have our Q&A session. So the next session is really about remoteness. So here we're talking about a rural scenario. And the question we're asking is, do you think that pharmacists working in rural communities where there isn't um, easy local access to a GP should be able to prescribe medicines. And we've taken a few suggestions here from the suggestions for use that have come out of our survey. So these are the kinds of things that people living in rural and remote areas of Australia are suggesting would be helpful or handy for them. And I'm going to throw to you first, Faye, so that just you can get yourself ready. So the question is, what do we do in a situation where there is limited local access to GPs someone needs a medicine that needs to be prescribed, do we think that in this case it'll be the pharmacy um, pharmacist working in potentially either a community pharmacy or in some cases they might actually be even working in a hospital um, or some kind of multifunction site where that's the only health site in a small community, um, should they be able to undertake this prescribing? So I'm going to start with you, Faye. What are your thoughts? Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, another great study here. Uh, we all uh, know that uh, access to healthcare in rural um, and remote areas of Australia is actually an, uh, an issue, a problem that we all have to face and we all have to admit that we do have an issue there and we all need to work together to improve access. So in those circumstances, absolutely, the pharmacy should be able to do more. And in Australia, the, fortunately, we do actually have a wide community pharmacy network whereby every single person on average actually lives within two and a half kilometres from a pharmacy. So access to healthcare from a pharmacy is available, the infrastructure is there. My main concern is that if there was no access to care, if there was no health care, that is harmful care. Because if patient has a medical condition and they're unable to get any level of health care, there could be detrimental um, consequences to their 
their health condition. And the situation is actually worse in a rural situation. And if I use the latest statistics on, on GP wait time, um, we all know that we do have um, a GP access crisis at the moment in Australia. And that, that is why all health professionals must work together to help address this issue moving forward. The average wait time, this is talking about average, it differs between metro and rural areas, but the average wait time has actually increased from two days up until four and a half days. And even though you might think that's a two day difference, but for a lot of medical conditions, especially if it's those um, acute conditions that require acute care, even 24 hours actually make a significant um, difference. The other interesting thing that I also want to point out that's relevant to this particular case study is also the bulk billing rate, because that has a lot to do with affordability um, to healthcare for people living in the rural and remote community. So the bulk billing um, rates in Australia um, have actually dropped uh, in the last um, few years, and more specifically comparing between the 2020 to 2022 data, we're seeing anywhere between a 5 to a 7% drop in um, uh, bulk billing rates of GPs. And if I take out um, Sydney and Melbourne as the main capital uh, areas, outside of Melbourne and Sydney, the average um, Australian adults actually only have access to free primary care in less than one in three GP clinics. That's actually based on the latest Clean Bill, uh, Clean Bill Blue report that was only just released in January 2023. Um, and some of the rates differ a little bit based on the location, whether it's rural uh, to metropolitan areas. So I think absolutely in those circumstances, there is a, a role for pharmacists to play there when it comes to prescribing. But once again, it goes back to those three key, key principles. There must be collaboration with a GP that may not be immediately right at that town, but available for that connection and that referral and advice. Absolutely, that must be in place. Um, and also, it should not be, we should never compromise patient uh, and consumer safety. So there must be safeguards in place um, uh, to ensure that timely access. Great, thanks, Patty. I'm going to go, go to you next, Aish. What do you think? What do you think should happen in the bush? I um, I agree with Faye, actually, and I believe that it would be beneficial if um, rural pharmacists are able to prescribe. However, um, I do, however, want to stress that trust is important. I do have experience myself going into chemists um, in the past when I was younger, you know, going in to get a morning, morning after pill and not feeling comfortable to ask that to a male pharmacist or even say that public, publicly in a community pharmacy where I know people surrounding me in that environment and just feeling very uncomfortable with that entire experience. Um, I remember earlier, um, with the survey responses, um, what James was mentioning about private consultative rooms in, in the pharmacy, I think that would be much preferred if they were widely available and if there are such in rural pharmacies. And um, also having some, and I think that would also um, encourage or not encourage, but I feel like that's not the right word, but you'd be able to have more of a culturally appropriate and sensitive sort of care sitting down and sitting down with the, the, the consumer and speaking to them and understanding what their needs may be to cater to that um, or, or to the scope of a pharmacist. Um, but I find trust being a huge issue. Um, and, and I've done some work with young people as well in rural New South Wales, and they've experienced the same thing where their entire community knows what they're seeking over the counter with the pharmacist because they're not able to have that conversation privately when, when seeking that um, medication. Great, thanks. Um, Asian. now it's your turn, Michael. What are your thoughts? Well, I'm not a rural GP, so I, I don't work in that environment. So my knowledge of that is a bit more limited, but I guess rural pharmacists do hold a special role uh, in their town, particularly where there's no GP in a particular town and they have to travel somewhere else to get their medical care. I would have thought that a lot of those towns already had a structure set up to accommodate that. Um, but whatever they do, they would need a really strong relationship with the GPs who do provide that patient care so that the, the care is the best. And the nurse practitioners also play a role in this. Sorry, Faye, I think the whole bulk billing discussion is a little bit of a furphy here. Um, there are lots of reasons why bulk billing is declining, which does impact on, on consumers and access to medical care. But, you know, there are a whole lot of reasons behind that, including the fact that the indexation of Medicare rebates is appalling. And we haven't heard yet how, how pharmacies are going to be paid for all of this. Uh, are people going to have to pay for this sort of stuff? 
I think there were some specific questions in the um, in the in the scenario that was put about rural pharmacy, particularly around interim prescribing of antibiotics and skin creams and things like that. Uh, things that most of these patients we're talking about with multiple prescribing, of course, are are people with long term chronic diseases and and see their GP for their scripts to get their medications. Um, and for most of my patients, for instance, they would get a six month supply of medication. They wouldn't necessarily, I'm not bringing them back every month. And if you take the oral contraceptive as the best example, most prescriptions are 12 months. So, you know, people need to be a little bit organized after 12 months to go back and organize to get a new one. GPs know about antibiotics. I'm not sure, and they know when to use and when they don't. I spent my life arguing with patients about not needing antibiotics. And I'm not sure in that circumstance that you can just provide an interim script for something like that on the basis that two days later they'll see the GP. I, I can't see how this is going to work. And a lot of pharmacies are also closed after hours. They're also closed after one o'clock or 12 o'clock on a Sunday, Saturday. Um, so a lot of those places still have no access to any care, care facilities at all. So I think the role is important. The pharmacist in particular towns will already have a relationship which they can use and access to contact GPs. And a lot of them run their own small community hospitals and the GPs also cover them. So um, again, I think this is quite limited in terms of how you can make this work, particularly with the examples that, that, that we're talking about here with chronic conditions and things like the pill. Great, thanks very much, Michael. Um, we're going to ask you all, have you on the call now, what you think? There'll be a poll come up shortly on your screen to ask you what you think should happen. So I'll give you a moment to read the question. Once again, you just pick, click one of those radio buttons, yes, no, or unsure, and we'll share the results of these at the end of the case study session. We've already got the results in for the first poll, very exciting folks. So click away. And um, we'll shortly go on to the final case study conversation. Thanks. So the last one is actually about antibiotics because this was an area where consumers were had very mixed views about, yes, definitely, I'd want to be able to go into a pharmacy and grab some antibiotics and, and no, under no circumstances, this is something that needs to be discussed with my um, medical practitioner. Um, People do report saying that they've had this before and they think, therefore, what I need now is a course of antibiotics and I just want to have that and get on with the rest of whatever I've got to do that day or that week. Um, so, Aisha, I'm going to come to you first in just a moment and ask you what you think about the role of pharmacists being able to prescribe antibiotics that are currently only available through um, a medical practitioner. So what do you think, Aish? Is it a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Yeah, I think it's a thumbs halfway. <laughs> I would be agreeable to this if um, uh, if if they are able to coordinate with the GP practice or see the medical history and and see the medical history of the patient um, and, and sort of avoid the consumer or patient, you know, developing, you know, um, resistance towards antibiotics. Um, I do. Like I was saying earlier, I feel like there are some parts of there are the minorities in the community, or um, I guess not lack of better terms, disadvantaged who don't. It may sort of contradict with their existing conditions, so just being aware of that. Um, but I think it would also it would avoid having those um, you know patients having to experience long wait times sitting in the GP practice. Great, thanks Aish. Now I'm going to come to you, Michael. What do you think about the role of pharmacists prescribing antibiotics? You started well, the, on that in your last conversation. Well, the whole, the whole issue of antibiotics is really complex because again, there's a report in the paper today about super resistance and super bugs and things like that. And the whole issue of um, antibiotic stewardship is really vital, I think, and we, we are staring at a, a situation where there are very few new anti, hardly any new antibiotics, and we're going to run out. I think we're talking about 2050, we'll have all these superbugs that all. Right. So, again, I, 
I see my, my practice is different now, but when I was younger, I saw a lot of young people, young children who would be in and out all the time with respiratory tract infections. We know that the statistics are that at least 70% of those are viral. And so again, the use of the use of antibiotics to treat viral infections becomes uh, has been a major issue and part of the education that was run um, over time, particularly through the NPS about appropriate antibiotics. So I'm not sure how a pharmacist makes a decision on the basis of what a patient tells them. You know, I can think of a family that I've treated for a long time where those children were always in with respiratory tract infections and there'd be almost a stand-up argument with the mother about why, why I wasn't going to give them a script and that I was happy to review them. I was happy to do that by phone. I was happy not to charge them for a review, a review consultation if it came to that and trying to not overuse antibiotics. So if I walk into a pharmacist and say, look, I've got a sore throat today, I want amoxicillin because that's what I always get. Is that the most appropriate thing? And if there's no examination, no check, even if it goes into a private consultation room, with all due respect to Faye, I'm not sure how good she's looking in the ears and looking down throats and auscultating chests and things like that. So. Uh, I'm, again, it's, a, it's one of those things where, where I think we have to be very wary about a particular thing like antibiotics. Thanks, Michael. Faye, you're going to get the last word on this one. What are your thoughts? Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, again, another great case study. You've got three really brilliant case studies here today. Um, whether a pharmacist should prescribe antibiotic for specific conditions, I think the answer to that is pharmacists should be given the um, authority to be able to exercise their professional judgment to decide if the antibiotic is suitable for that particular condition. And why do I say that? The reason is because the type of conditions, your answer is that whether an antibiotic should be used or not would vary significantly. So the example that um, Dr. Nolan gave around, if someone were to present to a pharmacy environment with on day one of cold and flu symptoms, and upon questioning, the pharmacist would have I would say 99.9% .9 identified that in this case, it's very likely due to a viral condition or at least at its early stage that would not require antibiotic use. So in those circumstances, pharmacists would not, I would confidently say uh, that was actually a standard practice, would actually not offer antibiotics, nor is it legal for pharmacists to do it at the moment. And the conversation was actually not about um, going to see a GP because you need antibiotics now, but it's rather around self-care and symptomatic relief to actually help the patient and the consumer feel better and to say that this is what you should be monitoring yourself for. If the situation changes, if the condition escalates, this is the, the time when you have to see a, doc, a, a GP to get antibiotics for. Now, an upper respiratory tract condition is a very different condition to if I now use the, the example as an acute urinary tract infection, if I may please. And I'm, I'm right now speaking, I, I suppose, from the perspective of a woman myself, who has experienced a urinary tract infection. There is a significant difference between day, even day two and day four um, in the course of my condition, whether I'm receiving antibiotics or not. So there are some conditions that will, will require urgent and immediate, uh, timely, I would use the word timely, access to appropriate antibiotics to actually avoid any negative or subsequent um, harmful conditions to, um, to harmful outcomes to the condition. But as I mentioned at the start of this, in any circumstances, pharmacists would always tell patients around what to monitor for and at what point should you actually be seeing a GP and actually undergo further testing. So once again, it comes back to how do we actually fill in that gap to ensure that there is actually timely access to care, but safe care. Um, I also, if I may point out that pharmacies now, um, because of COVID, we know that the relationship between community pharmacies and the locals that they service have actually um, significantly improved during COVID um, for various reasons. One of the many reasons is that a lot of the communities now actually present to their pharmacies, their local pharmacies, to get their COVID-19 vaccine. If you look at the latest uh, report, um, Pharmacists now every day provides more than 50% of COVID-19 vaccine in any given day. And what does this tell us? It tells us that um, there is actually an improved accessibility and access um, and connection and interaction between consumers and their local pharmacies. And that naturally presents an opportunity for the pharmacy to engage in conversations around healthcare, including appropriate use of antibiotics and promote antibiotic stewardship to reduce antimicrobial resistance. Pharmacists also because 
since COVID, um, there was a rapid escalation in the implementation of digital health. Pharmacists now have access to my health report for patients. And so long as patient gives um, consent to the pharmacist, pharmacists can have access to um, information, health information, including any GP notes um, that is actually on that patient's my health record to be able to provide and make a clinical decision based on informed um, information. The, the, the last point that, uh, if I may, Elizabeth, to add is a lot of the conversation now around prescribing, it's, a, it's about when do we start a medication, but really prescribing also includes scenarios where we alter the dosage of a medication or we de-prescribe. So if I may, you know, zoom in now into sort of de-prescribing, the scenario uh, that you had there earlier, Elizabeth, on scenario one, specifically in aged care, pharmacists in aged care um, have been doing a lot of de-prescribing specifically, specifically in aged care and also in the community pharmacy environment. So I just think that that's another point where uh, we need to take into consideration, even with antibiotic use, if a, a patient or consumer living in the community or whether they're a resident living in the aged care facility, if at one point in time an antibiotic, whether it's oral antibiotic or even topical antibiotic was initiated, if there was no medical intervention there to de-prescribe and stop that antibiotic when the condition is seized, that can lead to unnecessary um, you know, increase in the, in the risk of antibiotic resistance as well. So pharmacists could also come in there and de-prescribe to remove any medications that could be seized. Great, thanks very much to our panelists for their really interesting responses. And now it's your turn. We're gonna pop a poll up here shortly and ask you to vote. What do you think about the role of pharmacists in relation to the prescription of antibiotics? You know the drill, click on a button and then we'll share the results with you very soon. Okay, I'm going to now just provide you quickly with the results from our first two polls and um, and also um, start our conversation about our question, the question and answer conversation. We've got a, a, quite a few questions in the Q&A box. Um, the team have themed them up, some of them are similar to others. So um, it's not too late. If you do have a question, now is your time to pop it in. And as we go through the Q&A, every once in a while, I'll give you a, a result from the poll just to you know, keep you um, on your toes. So the first one I want to go to folks, and I'm going to ask you all this question, is the question about affordability. So there are a couple of questions in the chat that relate to what will be the impact of the affordability of care if we have pharmacists prescribing? Does it mean that now we'll be paying a pharmacist a charge? If there is a fee for this um, additional work, will it be something that might attract a Medicare rebate? And what might be a reasonable amount if this means that you don't have a GP consultation, does that mean you've um, saved it in one hand and then paid out in the other? Or would consumers be ahead in a model like this? Now, as, as far as I'm aware, there is there's, um, the government hasn't come out, uh, certainly the federal government, to talk about things like potential rebates, but really interested in your thoughts about whether you think this should be a paid service, whether it should be a service that the government funds, um, and um, how that might play out for consumers. We know that affordability more generally of all care is a big issue as the cost of living pressures really hit everyone hard. So I'm gonna start with you, Aish, what do you think? Do you think that something like this um, should incur a fee? Should it be something the government pays? Should it be something that consumers have to fund? And do you think that it might be a benefit to people if it was, um, depending on how the uh, cost was covered? I feel like consumers are left to pay a lot right now. Um, and I feel like if the government's able to fund, that would be much preferred. Um, I don't personally have private health insurance either. And I and I know that myself and my mum, who both suffer from chronic conditions, um, do actually have a lot of the medication that we have to pay on a regular basis. And that sort of affects our cost of living as well. Thanks, Aish. What do you think, Faye? How do you think this might play out? How much money your pharmacist is going to make out of this if it becomes reality? 
No, I always say if you want to, uh, if you're thinking about money, pharmacy is not the, the career for you because the money is not in pharmacy. A lot of the pharmacies that, are, that I know that I speak to are just people that are very passionate about, you know, the people that they deal with because they just see their like family to their own community. Um, the affordability issue that Ash actually raised, I just want to say, uh, Ash, that, that, that uh, you know, I really agree with what you just said there because affordability and out-of-pocket cost um, for consumers have really risen a lot, especially in the last five years specifically. Um, if I use the example of um, bulk billing versus non-bulk billing, in, in a practice, if I were to see my GP who is now no longer bulk billing, as a consumer, I have to pay between, you know, usually say $50 in my case, $50. And that's on top of the Medicare um, rebate of $39.75. So each time if I do go to a GP, that's actually how much it actually costs me out of pocket, $50. So it ranges between $30 to $50 depending on the, on the practice. So the last thing we want to see is inadequate, inadequate, inadequate um, healthcare access because access to healthcare should not um, should not differ based on consumers' health status, their social status, or their location. So that, that's what we're advocating for. Should pharmacy services be remunerated? Absolutely, it should be remunerated because the reason for remuneration is to ensure sustainability of the service. And the conversation should also be about this is bigger than just how much it's not just how much money it's actually going to, to save the particular consumer. It's actually more holistic than that, because if we can allow each health professional to, to be very efficient and practice at the top of scope, we're going to reduce unnecessary emergency department presentations and hospitalization that is also going to have a bigger healthcare cost and health impact on our overall healthcare system, which comes back to a lot of our consumers. All of us are taxpayers. So it, it actually also has an indirect um effect on all of us on our affordability in terms of our, our living. And I also want to take this opportunity to acknowledge the government's work um, on reducing the co-payment amount for consumers. Um, this is a big move that all of you would be aware of, and that would actually go a long way to improve the affordability of medicines. Thanks. Michael, what are you thinking? Oh, it's great to hear so how magnanimous everybody is in terms of this trying to save the health system and and, and look at, without being too cynical, there is clearly a, an issue around pharmacy funding now. The, the various agreements over time have downplayed the amount of dispensing fees and things that pharmacies have been paid for to, to do the work they're doing. And I think you can't run a business unless you charge for it. Um, like everyone would like the government to bulk bill, to provide a bulk billing item number, um, whether they do or not. But I guess good luck if you take that on, because in the end result, what you'll find is it'll be debated over time because they don't index them properly. Um, I think that that um, it's, it is great that the, the government have uh, reduced the co-payment. I, I, I think you know for a lot of my patients who are who are not on concessional cards, who have got four or five medicines a, a go, reducing the cost down to thirty dollars is fantastic. That that's really good. I, I guess if you bring this back to running a business. Uh, I'm interested to hear from Faye whether whether the, the PSA would want the government to provide an item number to be bulk billed or whether pharmacists are going to actually step up into a business mode and, and charge for what they do. Because that's why general practices are not bulk billing anymore. It's not physically vi uh, financially viable to bulk bill on a $39 rate, particularly if you do chronic disease and you see four patients an hour. So I'd love to hear from Faye as to as to what that what the, the, the push would be for this. Yeah, you raise a really good point there, Dr. Nolan, and thank you for explaining it's, from it's Michael, perspective sorry. around. Oh, it's Michael, sorry, Michael. Um, explaining from your perspective as as you know a, a very um, well trusted GP um, around your view on on bulk billing. I think if. You know, the, later, the last time when I looked at how much it costs a person to be in hospital, I was actually recently in the hospital myself. One day on average, I'm just, I'm not talking about even extensive, I'm not including surgery, I'm just talking about just hospital care. It costs our healthcare system between $1,000 to $1,500 per patient per day. Now, that is the cost that I think our government needs to consider, that that is actually costing our health system a lot of money, which is why if we can actually put more focus around preventative care and strengthening our primary care workforce, and that means, um, Michael, that means GPs, that means 
pharmacist. So if if the government um, and right now, you know, um, I really do applaud Minister Butler for his commitment to now uh, call for a Medicare re, uh, reform and review of the primary health care workforce, because if the investment is placed on the primary care environment to GPs, really strengthening the GP sector and really strengthening the community pharmacy sector. We're saving that hospitalization and even presentation. So the model there, this is why I think um, there is actually a lot of rationale for less out of pocket for consumers and more subsidy by the GP because um, when you do an extrapolation and when you consider pharmacoeconomic modeling, when you strengthen primary care, you actually save money from that tertiary care environment. So there is that scope to, to actually provide better care. And 100% agree with you there, Michael, that it has to be sustainable. All health care professionals' services must be sustainable and, and, and not just pharmacists, GPs must be remunerated adequately as well. Great, thanks for that. Privately built. Are you, are you going to privately build site? Well, the, the workforce at the moment is currently working through what that model would look like. And in some trials, it was out of pocket. And in some trials, it's actually funded through that particular trial. So there's a lot of models there to see um, what kind of model would actually enable uptake and what that impact is. So I think we're right now at the stage of looking through what model of implementation actually works. Um, and, you know, per perhaps CHF can run another session in about six months time and we will have that data to share with everyone. Great, thanks, Faye. I'm going to go on to the next question. I'm going to start with you first, one, Michael, because it's around clinical governance. And the question really is um, uh, relates to the notion that if you have a GP prescribing a medicine and then they go to a dispensing pharmacist, there are two checks, two independent people looking at what's being prescribed and potentially, as you've both mentioned, both Faye and Michael, having a conversation if someone's not sure about one or other aspect. If you move to an environment where we have a prescriber being the um, pharmacist making the decisions to use um, medicines that normally would only be available via a GP, what is the safety risk and um, um, what could be put in place if such a model is trialled in the States, what could be put in place to help manage this safety risk? So I'm going to go to you first, Michael, and then to Faye and NH. I guess it would mean require the communications between pharmacy and GPs to be really strong. If you went down a pathway like this, I'm not sure you can just say to a patient, here's a month's supply of a medication for treating an acute sy uh, symptom. Um, it would need to be reviewed pretty quickly. And I, I think the communication is the key in this. Clinical, gov <clears throat> clinical governance is an interesting area and, and we use clinical governance in our practice all the time to ensure that we provide the best care that we possibly can. Um, again, I think it's gonna come back to some discussion about who has the expertise to make final decisions about all these sorts of things. Um, and in the end result, I think it's gotta be the general practitioner. Uh, and I accept their access and the equity issues going on in primary care at the moment. And you know, I've spent probably 35 years fighting for an enhanced primary care as Elizabeth Wells not, well knows. And, um, it's been one of the important things from my point of view about practice going forward. Again, I think it's, it's you have to have clearly defined medications, you have to have clearly defined criteria. Um, and, and what I'd want to hear about is what is the training that a pharmacist is going to get to be able to be in the situation to just to prescribe medication. I'm not sure, I know one of my pharmacists said that they did a, a, a day's training to do, immun to do immunisation. <clears throat> My practice nurses do a 70 hour accredited course to do that. So who's got the knowledge? Um, how much training do they get? Um, how, how, how is that looked at and assessed? And where are the feedback loops to make sure that it's being done properly in the first place? Great, thanks. Babe, what are your thoughts about the managing the safety here? Yeah, definitely, Elizabeth. Safety is, is actually one of the key priority of PSA. Absolutely. Actually, I agree 100% there with Michael around the importance of communication. So there must be that ongoing communication uh, between the uh, between GPs and with pharmacists as well and any other allied healthcare professionals, but also at the same time, having that infrastructure, that system in place to facilitate that communication, whether it's digital form of communication or 
other means of communication. Um, the clinical governance um, that Michael mentioned, that's that's absolutely 100%, I think you nailed that one. It, there must be safe, um, safe and appropriate parameters in place with any clinical services. So that includes um, measures such as appropriate training, um, accreditation standards for those sorts of trainings, and you know the, the the clinical outcome measures, the processes measures, and an ongoing surveillance and ongoing monitoring system to continuously audit these processes, see where uh, improvements are needed and where there is actually a, a failed system. It needs to be addressed as soon as possible. And the standards and guidelines, and of course, ongoing continuing professional education and ongoing communication um, through to the members of the profession in in both um, sector medical and or pharmacy profession. Great. And Aish, what do you think? Have you got any concerns about, now you had two people looking at a prescription, now there's only one. How do you feel about that as a consumer? Sorry, could you say that again, Alyssa? Sure. So in the in the current system, there's kind of two people that look at the prescription, you know, say the GP and then the pharmacist. If we had a system where the pharmacist did all of this, then maybe one. Have you got any concerns about what that means for the safety of the work? Yeah, no, sorry. Um, I, I I agree with what Faye and Michael mentioned regarding communication and coordinated care. And unfortunately, the reason I was talking about trust earlier was the gaps in communication or or miscommunication rather. So, um, and I feel like that those would be key and having that sort of accountability and transparency throughout the process for the patient consumer um, receiving those medications. Great, thanks. I'm just going to give you first results from our first poll, which was the poll about non-dispensing pharmacists in residential aged care and um, primary care in, in general practice. So the results are 53% um, of people said yes, um, that would be something they'd support. 19% said no, we don't want to do that. And 22% were not sure. Of our three polls, and I've got all the results now, this is the one with the broader spread, the biggest group of people who are not sure if this is a good idea. Um, so I also just put, um, um, ask you to note that um, Claire from the Pharmacy Board has just popped a link in there doing a piece of work on the accreditation standards for pharmacy prescribing education programs. So those with an interest in this could go to the link and um, have a say there as well. Um, I'm going to go to the next uh, topic that there are quite a few questions about, and this uh, link uh, comes on, um, a follows on from the question about safety. And I'm going to go to you first this time, Aish, and this is about communication and making sure that there is a linking or exchange of information between the pharmacist and the person's usual caregiver. We're saying it's a GP, it might be a pharmacist, it could be somebody out, sorry, it could be a, a nurse practitioner, it could be a specialist, it could be anybody that is the person that normally manages this. So um, there are quite a few questions with people asking, do we think that the current systems for information exchange between pharmacy and the prescribers are good? And are there any things you'd like to see change to make sure that that information flow was really effective and kept everything safe? So what do you think? How are we doing at the moment? Is it good or do we need to improve it? And if we do, what are we got to do next? Thank you. I actually, the reason for my, I guess, negative attitude towards it is because I've never experienced a positive way of how communication has been trans transferred, you know, um, well across a team um, in, in multidisciplinary care or the sort of primary health care sort of um, transition. And it's made it a really inconvenient and frustrating process for myself and my mum that when I was, a, when you know, being a young carer and even currently just made it a very frustrating process, not knowing who to go to for what, having to explain myself numerous times, um, not knowing, who, you know, even from the medication sort of um, lens, not knowing what to take for what. Now I've, you know, learned much more about and, and have a basic health literacy sort of level, but I used to struggle with that. And having some sort of culturally appropriate and sensitive care would assist in that process as well. Um, I don't think, you know, it's not a one size fits all sort of um, experience for every consumer and going down to the patient's eye level and understanding their 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 needs and how um, it can be catered for. Um, I don't know how it can be improved. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry. 
No, that's okay. You don't need to solve all the problems on one day. Um, Faye, what do you think? Do you think the communication as it stands now is good enough or we need to augment it in some way if we were going to go forward with this proposed change in clinical practice? Elizabeth, I think there's always room for improvement when it comes to communication. I think communication between GPs and pharmacists have actually increased over the last three years because of COVID-19 vaccine administration and prescribing and so on, but there's always room for improvement. And the example that Ash actually um, gave was actually really good because what Ash just um, uh, presented was the challenge when it comes to communication between health professionals when a, when a consumer transitions between care settings. So transitions of care um, is when communication is extremely critical. So whether that's um, communication between when um, a consumer is in a hospital environment to when they're discharged to when they receive secondary or specialist care and when they go back to their GP and when they go to the pharmacy and so on. So that whole communication and transitions of care cycle needs to be absolutely be improved and in my mind how do we achieve that we really need two things to improve communication between our doctors and pharmacists one is that we actually need to have the system to enable that um, my ideal if in my own ideal land i would love to see real-time communication you know, I, would, I used to say timely communication, if not real time, is what I'm saying, because as a consumer, I think consumers should not worry about what happens behind the scene. The care provided to consumers should be so seamless that communication behind the scene should just happen. That's in an ideal world, I understand, but that's the gold standard that we should be moving towards. And in the digital age that we live in at the moment, we should absolutely use technology and information communications technology to, to, to help, us, help us achieve that. And at the moment, we don't actually have a system that enables um, a GP and a pharmacist to have that real-time communication. And the second is, um, I suppose, is the willingness between two healthcare professionals um, to not just the willingness, but also their availability um, and the understanding to really prioritise communication for the benefit of consumers. And that, that may be, you know, I, I would always say, start from even during university days, um, learning together, learning to understand each other's scopes, learning to build that rapport between healthcare professionals and that understanding between healthcare professionals, and also doing continuing professional educations together um, for registered healthcare professionals to better understand how we can all work together. Thanks. And, and, and Michael, what do you think? Um, uh, do you think we're doing this well enough? And if not, where are the opportunities for improvement? Well, I think, again, <clears throat> the electronic health record has opened up quite a lot of opportunities for us to go. So in my consulting room, I can open up from my prescribing software, from my software, into a, into a health record. And I can look at, it's not always up to date, which is concerned because you go looking to see which medication was dispensed when and who prescribed it. Um, so I can do that a little bit now, though. I think there's a bit of variability about what gets uploaded. I, I'd like to think every prescription, well, for everyone who's got an electronic health record, because there are people who've closed theirs off, that there's an ability to upload not only um, prescriptions, but pathology and radiology. And um, that's not all there yet. Um, but at least it, I can do that now. It's also easy for me because I've got a good relationship with local pharmacies, um, particularly those ones I'm dealing with have got aged care for places that they look after that I can, I can either email them or I can ring them and can get that communication going pretty well. The electronic health record is, I know it's about to be revamped, isn't it, Elizabeth? Isn't that, isn't that the, the ministers get rid of PDF files and make it something more worthwhile? Um, but I, I think that that should be the basis of of being able to access things that way. And then the direct lines of communication will be there depending on the relationships between the GP and the pharmacist. Great, thanks. That was a really useful conversation. Now, results of the second poll, this was the question about rurality and um, pharmacy uh, prescribing. So here, 72% of people said yes, that thought that would be reasonable. 21% said no, and 7% were not sure. So this is the answer where there's a smallest group of people that are not sure. Uh, people were more confident to say yes or no. And this is the strongest yes out of our three case studies. 
So we've probably got time for just one more question. Um, I'll, I'll start with you, Michael, because you're on the screen and then I'll go to you, um, Faye and, and Aish. I'm not sure in which order. I'm going to keep you guessing this time. This is a question about the, you're going to love this, the Bush lawyers, the medico legal um, um, potential responsibility for adverse events. So say a GP's prescribed a medication, a pharmacist repeats that medication and there's an adverse event, who's responsible? And um, uh, do you have any concerns about this? Or again, are there ways you can think we can best manage this, um, the uh, care of um, adverse events and the potential medical legal consequences? Michael, what do you think? Is this something to worry about or just a furphy? Well, I'm, I'm the, if I'm the prescriber, I carry the responsibility. If there's an adverse effect, if, if, there's a, if there's an effect that occurs to a patient, I would hope the patient would report that to me and then and they do, you know, I, I start them on a medication and it causes a side effect. Um, they come back to me, I'll change the medication. Hopefully no patient would continue to take that medication and put up with the side effect. But if I, if I do the prescribing, I carry the legal liability. It's what the five or six thousand dollars a year I pay in indemnity fees is going to need to go towards. Um, I'm assuming your pharmacy prescribe um, beyond the repeat discussion, um, they would have to have some liability, and I assume they carry some insurance for that. Because pharmacists are being asked to give medical advice all the time, and I'm assuming they do have some sort of insurance to cover them as long as they're working within their scope of practice. Thanks, Michael. Um, Faye, we're nearly out of time. Can you give us a quick response? Sure, Elizabeth. I agree 100% with Michael there. Every healthcare practitioner, whether it's pharmacists or GPs, are independent um, clinicians, independent practitioners. So you're right, uh, Michael, pharmacists would have professional indemnity insurance. And in this case, the pharmacists will have um, or should and should have um, kept that legal obligation as well. And that applies to not only when a GP uh, prescribes a medication and the pharmacist dispenses, the pharmacist will still carry that legal liability. I'm not going to ask you about this one, Aish, because it's more about the legal insurance that the two professional groups have and whether they think it's okay as it is and would be into the future. Um, I'm going to give you the results of our last poll, folks, which was the one about antibiotics. Um, this one here, we had 59% of people say yes, 30% no. That's our strongest no out of the three polls and 10% not sure. So different answers to each of them. Thank you very much for um, participating in the polls. It was terrific. Um, we haven't got to all the questions, but we have got to most of them. Um, so at this point, um, I'm going to start to finish us off for tonight. First of all, I'd like to give a huge thanks to our panellists who have really engaged with questions, some of which in this Q&A they've had no prior notice of but have provided us with really insightful and respectful commentary about um, where this might head into the future, noting that there is certainly some um, controversy about whether this is a good direction to go in. So I'd love you to put into the chat your thanks for the panellists and give them a round of applause. Um, also like to thank um, James for his presentation on our survey results. James done a huge amount of work in that. And also while I'm doing the thanking all of our other team members, Jenna, Melissa and Joe, thank you to all of you for helping us um, get this moving today. We're always keen on your feedback. So you can pop in the chat or you can send us an email um, to let us know um, if this was a useful panel for you. Um, if we just go, uh, we, we have, remember that Claire's put into the chat um, her um, uh, consultation opportunity. So I encourage you to engage with that if you can. And um, we've got a couple of last slides before we finish off. Um, so the first is just what's next? Well, we know that in Queensland and New South Wales, the state governments are already moving in this direction. And we watch closely, um, Victoria is suggesting also that they might consider a trial. So it'd be interesting to see what happens. There are lots of what's next. There's what's next for consumers, what's next for pharmacists, what's next for those that traditionally were in this space, and of course, for both the jurisdictions and the federal government. Um, watch this space. We certainly watch it very eagerly, and we encourage you to continue the conversation with us um, on our socials. Um, you'll be, we have a range of different social media um, uh, handles, and there's a slide here that shows them all. Um, You'll be pleased to know, uh, oh, yep. Um, 
So I'd like to, uh, I'll put the one at the end. I'd like to thank you all for your time. Um, it's been really terrific having this conversation. We've recorded this session and we will send out a link to this for you all so that you can watch it again and again or share it with your colleagues. Um, and if you want to continue the conversation with us, as I said, we've got lots of different social channels. Uh, I think we've got a slide. You'll be pleased to know that I don't post my lunch on Instagram and I've yet to do the TikTok dance, though I will do a TikTok dance if I get enough requests, despite the fact that this fills my children's minds with complete horror. So once again, thank you so much for your time. It's been a really terrific conversation and let us know if you want more about this or any other topic. And we're really happy to support these kind of conversations. Um, I hope you all stay well and you have a great rest of your week. Okay, bye folks. <laughs>